It is always a delight uh, to be here. Um, I know many of you, and I've seen many of you at different places and conferences over the years. Uh, something that I have found helpful to say that I hope uh, is clear and doesn't need to be said to all of you, that conferences can be wonderful, they can be helpful, they can bring people together from different backgrounds, different places, um, but conferences, uh, even conferences like these, are not really ultimate. Uh, conferences can serve us, they can help us, they can inform us, they can challenge us, but ultimately what God has ordained is the church. And we understand that. And we understand that we, of course, as believers are the church, but it's, it's the local church, it's our local church pastors. It is the elders and the deacons and the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and kids that we worship with each and every week. That's what God has ordained as the primary regular means for our growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Too often I have found that conferences and even those speaking at conferences fail to really talk about this and mention it. And when I was a young Christian, even young in uh, the, the Reformed world, it wasn't emphasized very often. I didn't hear it emphasized. And I didn't realize how important being a part and a member, a committed member, of a local church was. For those of us who weren't really raised in the church, we didn't really understand that. And so I simply want to emphasize that to all of us, that we would be committed members to our local churches, that we would more feast on our pastor's sermons week in and week out than all of the different podcast sermons that we could find on the internet, that we would be churchmen, that we'd be faithful to our local churches and encouragers, praying for our pastors and our elders. So tonight, as we spend a little bit of time together in closing, I want us to begin by looking at Psalm 11, and then we're going to look at another passage or two briefly this evening. And so the passage that is before us is Psalm 11. I know that you have already been instructed in this, but I want us to look at, in particular, at verse 4. I'll read from verse 1 all the way through verse 7 of Psalm 11 chapter 11. This is the word of God. To the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark, at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds, the upright shall behold his face. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, your love, for the way in which you care for us, Lord, in ways that we don't even see. Father, we ask that you would help us, that by your Holy Spirit, you would illumine your word, that we would understand it, that you would help us to love it, And that we would come away from our time together, not just with greater knowledge, with a greater understanding, but with a greater love for you, a greater love for one another, a greater dependence upon our Savior, a greater encouragement as we depend upon the Holy Spirit within us. So Lord, help us to come away not only with bigger heads and greater knowledge, but bigger hearts filled with love for you, our Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now, the language that we find throughout Scripture is 
that the Lord's throne is in heaven and that the Lord's throne is heaven. That heaven is his throne, as we read in Isaiah 66, and the earth is his footstool. That heaven is the throne of God, that that is where God abides. That heaven is his place, that is where he reigns from. And so the psalmist here, David, prays to the Lord and praises him and attests that the Lord's throne is in heaven, his temple, his holy temple is there, and then deduces rightly that his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. Regarding his eyes seeing, we could of course talk a great deal about omniscience, the omniscience of God, that God knows all, that God sees all. But then David goes on to say this, his eyelids test the children of man. Now, in one sense, David is reiterating much the same thing he said when he said the Lord sees, but he uses a different word here. The word he uses translated for us is eyelids. Well, what on earth is David talking about? Well, it seems, and scholars seem to suggest that the, the language here is of the way in which the Lord, and we're speaking of the Lord here anthropomorphically, as if he had eyelids, as if he had arms and legs and eyes to see and so on, but that the Lord uses his eyelids in the same way that we sometimes use our eyelids when we are closing them in order to focus, in order to look carefully at what might be going on. And so the idea here is of the Lord looking very particular, not just seeing in general, not just sort of seeing as he sees all things, but actually looking in a penetrating way at all that goes on. You see, when we talk about the omniscience of God, I think too often we think of God's all-knowingness and all-seeing as just some sort of general way of looking upon everything. I think that's the way the world thinks of God. You know, the world believes in God. Even so-called atheists believe in God. They just don't like God. They hate God. And so it's easier for them just to act as if he doesn't exist. But everyone knows God exists. Everyone knows that God exists. They just can't bring themselves to admit it. And so even the way in which the world speaks about God, it's fascinating to me. Just listen to the way in which the world talks about God. They talk about God doing this. They talk about God doing that. They talk about divine intervention. They talk about God knowing this and God seeing that. But typically what they mean is God seeing in general or seeing sort of when he wants to or when they want him to. But David says it's not just that God sees, implying that God knows, but that God is looking in a careful, focused, and penetrating way upon all things. That our God is not just sort of lazily aloof, sitting back and just watching what goes on and see what happens. I think that's the way a lot of people think God is. I think that's the way a lot of Christians treat God. I think they think, well, God got all this started. He created everything. He saved me, but for the most part, he's just sort of sitting back, watching to see what happens next. So if he's watching the show of world history go on before him. But here the idea is that the Lord is not only on his throne, but the Lord knows exactly what's going on. Now when we think of a throne, what do we think of? Well, typically we think, of course, of a monarch, of a king, of a queen. And too often, when we think of a king or queen upon their throne, Usually we think of them in all their regalia and all the pomp and circumstance that goes with a king or a queen on his or her throne, but typically we think of them just sort of sitting there doing nothing. But the idea that we're to get of a king on his throne of God Almighty in dominion and having all authority is not someone just doing nothing, not some being just sort of lazily sitting by waiting for people to do things, but rather having such dominion, having such authority that he has everything perfectly under control 
that he has all of his delegates, all of his ambassadors, everyone under his authority doing everything that they are supposed to be doing, and thus he is able to sit and order and ensure that everything is being done and being carried out precisely as the king desires. Now when we talk about God knowing and God's power, when we talk about God's omniscience, we're talking about something that really every Christian affirms, aren't we? I mean, growing up in the church or not, you hear about God and you hear about God's power, most people rightly conclude that God can see all, that God knows all. And so, when you first came to study theology and you first came to grasp different words, theological terms, and you heard the term omniscience, that God knows all, that God sees all, I'm sure it didn't make you wrestle with it all that much. Most people I have found in my ministry believe that. It's not something you have to convince them of. It's not something that they, they have to be uh, you know, argued about over and over again. Most people, de- you know, kind of it doesn't depend on where they're coming from, whether they're coming from Baptist or Evangelical or Presbyterian, Reformed churches, they believe it. But when you talk about God being in control, some people will say, well sure, I believe that God's in control, but then But then you have to ask the question, well, what is God in control of? Or how is God in control? That's to say, in what manner is he in control? And to what degree is he in control? And when you ask that series of questions, that's when people begin to disagree. When you ask that question, that's when people really begin to argue. Now, I don't know where you are, I don't know what place you are in your understanding of theology, but many of you have been in conversations, you've been in arguments, you've been in studies with people where they simply are wrestling with this very question, how is God in control? And to what end is He in control? Now, the Bible answers this question, but I have to tell you, for many years of my life, after coming to Christ, I didn't believe the Bible actually gave us an answer. I believe that as I studied Scripture, the Bible sort of presented a God who was in control to a degree, that He was sovereign to a degree, that He was almighty overall to a degree, that God is God to a degree. Now, I didn't realize that's what I believed, but as I worked out my theology, as I tried to explain what it is I believed, the reality of it is, is what I believed is that God really isn't in control of everything, God really isn't almighty over all, that God really isn't God. And it took me a few years to really wrestle with these things, to really try to understand what the Bible taught. I remember going through the entirety of Scripture, and I had a notebook. And on one side of the page, I wrote things in Scripture, verses, passages, that seemed to indicate that God is in control. And I wrote on the other page throughout this notebook, passages where it seemed to suggest that God was not completely in control that man was in control, that we had a certain freedom, that we had a certain responsibility. And so what it did was, as I made my way through Scripture, as I was trying to put these things down and make sense of all of this, again, not knowing what Reformed theology was, not understanding the biblical doctrine of the sovereignty of God, I was trying to figure all this stuff out for myself. And I came to realize through this study, as I made my way through Scripture, that I kept running up against what was everywhere, is that I had to come to grips with the fact that God is sovereign over all, that God is almighty over all, or that God, simply put, 
is God. And I didn't like it. In fact, I came to a point of crisis. A point of crisis in my life and in my faith because I couldn't understand how it is that God who is sovereign, and if God is God and God is all the things that he tells us that he is, if God is loving, if God is good, if God is righteous, well, how is it that a good, righteous, and loving God can sovereignly allow, permit, ordain, How is it that this God can do all these things? How is it that God can be on his throne? How is it that he can be in control of everything and yet all of the misery, all of the evil, all of the sadness, all of the hurt, all of the grievous and heinous and miserable things happen every minute of every hour of every day in this fallen world? And really what I was wrestling with is that very ancient question of the problem of evil. What I came to realize is that the question I was asking, if God is this, if God is on his throne, if God is in control, how is it that all these bad things can happen? How is it that all this evil can exist? When I really came to grips with the reality of the fall of man, of the reality of our sin, As I came to grips with the reality of who God is, I actually began to ask an entirely different question. And the question wasn't, if God is good and loving and just and righteous, how can all of this evil exist? I began to ask the question, why doesn't more evil exist? Why? Isn't there greater sin? Why aren't there more murders? Why aren't there more terrorist attacks? As I began to understand who our God is from his revealed word, I came to realize that we could be far worse off than we are, but because God is merciful, and slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness to his people. Because God is God, he keeps things from becoming completely out of control. He is the one who restrains. He is the one who by his mercy withholds. He is the one who in his sovereignty keeps us from killing each other off the face of the earth. When we really come to understand what we're dealing with throughout all of history and today, as we consider everything that's going on in the world and everything that's happened throughout world history, what's amazing is you begin to see the restraining mercy of God so that he might have, according to his perfect sovereign will and according to his sovereign mission that we might be here today. We're here because God saw to it that our forefathers and our ancestors lived through misery, lived through wars, lived through plagues and famines, that we might exist today because we exist because God foreordained from before the foundation of the earth that we who are chosen in Christ might be alive and exist today. Now, when we understand this and we, we get this, we see it everywhere. That's why people will talk about the sovereignty of God being on every page of scripture because once you grasp it, you see it everywhere. You see how God and his providence is constantly at work. You know, we use that phrase in the providence of God Well, everything is in the providence of God. And so if you say in the providence of God, just make sure you follow it up by saying, as everything is, because when we speak of the providence of God, we're speaking of God in his providence, working out all things according to his ultimate ends. 
God ordains not only the ends of all things, but he ordains the means to those ends. And God in his providence is working all things according to the good purpose of his will. That's Paul's point there in Ephesians 1, that everything that God is doing, he is working according to his own ends. And that helps us in understanding why God does what he does, why God allows what he allows, why God permits, why God foreordains, why God orchestrates all things, one of the most simple answers is he does it according to his own will, according to his own counsel, and according to his own good pleasure. And so when we ask the question, well, if God is sovereign, and if God is good, if God's real, if he's powerful, And if he sees all and knows all, why would he allow this? Why would he permit this to happen? I hesitate to go through various examples because it would be too painful for all of us. Because the reality of it is is that when we go through acute times of pain and suffering and loss, question does seem to creep up in our minds, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me, or how could you allow this to happen to me? You know, it's interesting to me, I found over the years something that I think we all have the tendency to do. When a brother or sister in the faith goes through something, something miserable befalls them. Some just awful thing happens in their life. You know, what we, you know what we do? I think sometimes we, we secretly fall into asking the question, but even making the judgment and the charge saying, God, I know they did something to deserve that. I know I know I didn't like him. I know he's got some secret sin. I know they've got something going on. I know they did something to deserve that. But when it happens to us, what do we do? Say, God, what did I do to deserve this? I didn't deserve this, Lord. But we treat others as if they are deserving of that misery coming upon them. But when it happens to us, we say, God, what have I done? It's not fair. Aren't I special? And we question God. We say, God, why have you done it like this? Why did you carry it out like this? God, why have, you, why have you made things like this? Why have you made me like this? Why have you made the situation like this? Why have you given me this burden to bear, this misery to go through? We ask those questions. And the question is not do we ever ask those questions. The question is where do we go and where do we run when we ask those questions? And where we need to run is to the gospel. Where we need to run is to the character of God as he has told us who he is. Look with me at Romans. Romans chapter nine. Very important passage in understanding all of this. A passage I trust you have studied thoroughly. By the way, just as a a, a word of counsel, if you ever are engaging with someone who doesn't yet understand the doctrines of God's sovereignty and salvation. Notice I use the word yet, because as you know, if they're true Christians and they keep studying the word of God, they're eventually gonna come to see it. But if you're ever wrestling with someone and they are, are dealing with all of the different concepts and questions, I would just suggest that you stop the argument for a moment and tell them to go and study the Bible, to go and study the entirety of Romans. Not just read it, study it. To study it for a time, to study the book of Ephesians, to study the Gospel of John, to get into it and to really examine it because when they do, your conversation with them will be very different on the other side. Because if they've really studied the word of God, they've really grasped, they might have questions, they might be wrestling with things, but they've at least grasped the the proper foundational points of theology so that you could have an intelligent conversation with them. 
And I found over the years it's been very helpful because true Christians who truly want to learn, who truly want to grow, who truly want to be challenged by the Word of God will be challenged by the Word of God and less so by me and more so by the Holy Spirit. And Romans chapter 9 is an important chapter in this epistle and really an extremely important chapter in the entirety of the Word of God because of what Paul does, not only in chapter nine, but really leading up to chapter nine from chapter one through eight, of course. And Paul is laying the groundwork throughout and building such a beautiful, blossoming, it's almost like an ever-blossoming flower, just keeps blooming. And in chapter nine, what Paul is doing here is what we refer to theologically as theodicy. Now, when I say theodicy, I don't mean the classic book, The Odyssey, but rather The Odyssey, one word from theos, God, and dice, or from DK, righteousness or justice, what we're speaking of when we speak of theodicy is the justice of God. And so when we're doing the work of theodicy, as Paul is doing in Romans 9, he is explaining, giving an argument for, in one sense giving a defense for the justice of God. Because the question would naturally be asked if we're dealing with the sovereignty of God, that he is over all, that he is almighty over all, that he is orchestrating all things that come to pass, and that we as human beings are called to believe, that we are called to obey, and that we are responsible for whether we believe or not, and we are responsible for whether we obey or not, and that those who reject him go to suffer in eternal damnation, God's eternal wrath. When you deal with those things, people are gonna naturally ask the same question. Not so much about the problem of evil ultimately, but they're gonna ask the question, how can God be just? How can he be righteous? Paul answers that question, and he answers that question throughout. We don't have time to get into the entirety of this chapter tonight. That would take a few weeks together, but I want you to look at just one passage in verse 14 and following. Paul writes the following in Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? What's our answer to this? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. God forbid. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So, verse 16, that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So, then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, do you understand what Paul's saying? Now, if you grasp what he said in chapters one through three about our human depravity and our deadness and our sin and that no one seeks God, but we run from God, we hide from God, and if God came down, we'd kill him, and that's precisely what we did when he did come. When you understand that, then you'll understand how the grace of God has to be at work in order to take anyone from that place of being an enemy of God, dead in his sin and trespasses, being a complete wretch in opposition to God, and make him to be at peace with God. What Paul's doing in Romans 9 is explaining how this is, and even, he even answers in part the question of why. The Bible doesn't always do that. The Bible doesn't always give us the the particular answers to our questions as to why this and why that. But the Bible does give us an overarching ultimate answer to that question, and we see it in part in this passage. Now remember what Paul's dealing with. He's dealing with the question, if God is sovereign, if God is God and God is good and God is all these things, how is it that these things can be true? How is it that God in his sovereignty works all these things out? Paul's not just dealing with what we first really come to grips with at the end of Genesis, what Joseph said to his brothers, helping us to understand how God works in his providence, what some theologians have sometimes referred to as the doctrine of concurrence, 
when Joseph said, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good that he should rescue or save many people alive this day. Paul's not just echoing that. Paul's, Paul's explaining something much more foundational. And the way he does it is really quite fascinating because Paul doesn't hold back here. You see, too often when we try to explain God's sovereignty in all things or God's sovereignty in salvation, too often what I have found many of us attempt to do is we try to soften it. We, we try to sort of uh, give, give kind of the good parts of it, but we kind of leave out the harder parts of it. You know what I mean by that? We talk to people about God's sovereignty and saving. We say, well, God saves you by his grace. And everyone says, well, sure, I believe God saves me by his grace, right? Well, what do we mean by that? I mean, God saves us by his grace. Now, every Christian affirms that. Every Christian affirms that God saves. Every Christian affirms that God saves us by his grace. But not every Christian actually believes that. They think they do. They understand it to a degree, perhaps, but they don't actually believe that. Because when you really press them on that, when you really begin to ask them the hard questions about what that means, they can't affirm what Paul is teaching right here in Romans 9. Nor can they in any way articulate the antithesis, that which would be against the statement that God saves us by his grace. It's easy for us to talk about how God elects. It's easy for us to talk about how God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. The hard part is when we have to talk about the reality that if God elects, it also means that God is the one who condemns. It means that if God has chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the earth those who are his, it also means that God is the one who has passed over those that he has chosen to condemn. You see, if you only believe in the doctrine of election, but you don't believe in the doctrine of reprobation, you don't actually believe in the doctrine of election. If you think you believe that God saves us by his grace, but you don't actually believe that God is purposefully, sovereignly, intentionally not saving others by his grace, you don't actually believe that God saves us by his grace. You believe that you and him together work out your salvation. Now, no one would say that. But in reality, that is what we have to affirm. Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He doesn't hold back. Paul gives the entire picture through one example which everyone was familiar with, Jew and Gentile alike, and it's the example of Pharaoh from Exodus. Paul brings this together and says very plainly that This is the example. If you want an example from Scripture of how it is true, just as God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, so then it depends not on human will or exertion. It's not dependent on what we do. It's not dependent on how much we do it. It's dependent on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh from Exodus 9, 16, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You see, what we read in Exodus, what we read here in Romans 9, is not just that God allowed Pharaoh to be himself. The language is that God actually raised him up. 
that God appointed him, he appointed this exact man with this exact personality, this exact hardness of heart to be the exact Pharaoh in the exact time in world history to do exactly what he would do. And yes, God did permit, God did allow, but it's not, as our confession says, by a bare permission. And again, even there, our wise theologians are saying, there's a bit of mystery here. We don't fully understand this. What we do know is that God is sovereign. What we do know is that God has ordained all things that come to pass. What we do know is that God permits and that he allows, that he's neither the author nor the approver of sin, but that God also is somehow actively making these things happen. And there's mystery there. Our finite minds cannot fully comprehend the actions of our infinite God. We can't grasp how these things are in the end. All we have to deal with are the facts, the truths that God gives us. And for those who wanna say, well, this is all just mystery, we really can't understand any of this, well, why does God tell us about it? Why does God reveal these things to us? Why does he talk to us about this? Why does he explain these things to us? It's so that we would know him. It's so that we would understand him. It's so that we would trust him. So that we would depend upon him. So that when evil comes, when misery comes, when terror strikes our hearts and our homes, that we know where to go so that we can understand world history and everything that has taken place in history is not some aimless, purposeless, just cycle of continued days and weeks and months and years and millennia on end, that there is a purpose in all of it. That's why Paul gives us this example that God says to Pharaoh, for this purpose, I've raised you up. And what's that purpose? That I might show my power in you. God might demonstrate his power through the Pharaoh of Egypt. And that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, what we need to understand that in secondary ways, so much of what God permits, so much of what God ordains, so much of what God allows, so much of what God sovereignly orchestrates, we don't understand always how this directly relates or how this directly brings about these same ends, but what we do know is this, is that we can't always put the puzzle pieces together, though we can't always connect the dots. And sometimes we try to do that, and I think that we sometimes enter into sin and error. We need to be very, very careful in our own lives, and especially in the lives of others, not to try to connect these dots of God's providence as if we're God. See, the point of our trials and the point of things that happen in this world is not for us to start to say, I figured this out. I know what God's doing here because we wanna be in control, don't we? We wanna have all knowledge and we want to see all, we want to give the impression, especially to those we want to impress, that we have figured it out. We don't always know, but we do know is this, is that ultimately God is doing all things according to his own perfect will and for his own good pleasure. And he's also doing it ultimately for his own glory. I'm not just saying that, and I know you're not just believing it, because those of us who've been through miserable experiences in our lives, we just want the pain to go away, and it seems not to go away. We want the sadness to go away. We want the hurt to just stop. We pray and we pray and we pray, God, why did you allow this? 
How could you have allowed this? God, just make it stop. Make the pain stop. Make the hurt stop. Make the misery stop. Heal my wife. Heal my son. Heal my daughter. See, what we have to recognize is the same thing that Paul recognized. Because he understood this didn't just apply in the history of Israel when it came to Pharaoh, but that it also applied to our lives. Because it's only when we recognize this truth about who God is and what God does and why he does it, that we will begin to echo what our Lord said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see, even in our own suffering, God's power is made perfect. Your suffering, God uses as a testimony to those watching. The misery that he has permitted in your life, as you come through it trusting him, depending upon him, and still praising him, God uses your suffering so that others in your lives and throughout the world might know and proclaim his name. It's not just through Pharaoh. It's through our own suffering. You see, your suffering is not just for you. And while we don't understand always why God allows it, we know ultimately that God is using it that as he's conforming us to the image of his son, that as we are sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings, as we are enduring the miseries of this life and this fallen world, God is using it all for his name and his glory. You see, your suffering is not for nothing. God has raised us up to live in this time in world history so that people where we live, in our communities, and our families, might hear the gospel, might see us live out the realities of the truths of the gospel in our lives, and might say, please tell me about the hope that is within you, because it doesn't make any sense. And we can tell them you're right because the hope and the peace that we have doesn't really make any sense. It's beyond sense, it's it's beyond understanding. I shouldn't have peace, I shouldn't have hope. The reason I have it is because the Holy Spirit is within me, because God is giving me hope, giving me peace, enabling me to endure, and enabling me to praise him even when I'm miserable. And whenever we're tempted to disbelieve, whenever we're tempted to doubt, whenever we're tempted to question God, we need to remember Paul's response, who are you, O man, to respond to God? Who do you think you are? Because the reality of it is it could be a whole lot worse. But because of God's mercy, And because of God's grace, he is the one who wounds, but his hands heal. He is the one who breaks, but his hands make whole. He is the one who allows us to be brokenhearted, but he is the one who saves those who are brokenhearted and crushed in spirit so that we might find ourselves 
on our knees, thanking Him for preserving us so that He gets all the glory. That's why the psalmist, I believe, reiterates in Psalm 115, not to us, no, not to us, but to you belongs all glory. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we thank you. Father, help us to depend upon you at all times and in all circumstances that you might get all glory from our lives as we rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ, all by the power of your Spirit. Amen.